scripture this morning that we're going to be going through is going to be on your pew bible page number 940 if you need it uh, it will be romans 3 1 through 20 what advantage then is there in being a jew or what value is there in circumcision much in every way first of all they have been entrusted with the very words of god what if some did not have faith will their lack of faith nullify god's faithfulness not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, so that you can be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness, so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as we are being slanderously reported and saying, as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result? Their condemnation is deserved. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have turned, they have together become worthless, and there is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are like open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin, misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Amen. Thank you, Scott. Well, I do hope you have your Bible open. That's the crux of the matter as we continue working through the scriptures together. This amazing book of uh, Romans that uh, is a letter written to a church. I was thinking about how, and we'll talk in a moment, how different people are proud of their heritage. Thinking about where they come. I think about the St. Louis area. Um, when you stop and think about what to be proud of. And I remember, I just know when I've talked to different people, one of the first things that comes up is the fact that you have a team that wins games. We, under, we understand that, all right? And uh, it's great. But when you think about the history of St. Louis, an amazing uh, place. And uh, one thing in particular, you think about our country as it moved westward and the start of it was in the St. Louis area. To see Lewis and Clark and to know their history is an amazing accomplishment. When you start, Just the fact when you and I drive west and we think we're on a highway that's you know, pretty drivable, these people were dealing with what they were dealing with, moving west, and we get the benefits of all of that. As a young man growing up in Chicago, we had a lot of Chicago pride. And uh, I'm 10 years old, and it's uh, the, the 100th anniversary of the Chicago fire. So you think about this. St. Louis is proud of the fact that they had a start of moving westward. Chicago talks about a fire, all right? And... If you remember, the, th the theory was that Mrs. O'Leary's cow, all right, kicked over a lantern in a stable, and that was the start of what happened that was um, horrendous. It went from uh, the 8th of October to 150 years ago today is when the fire ended. It ended on Tuesday of that week. 
And um, you, w growing up, you'd hear the whole history. And I remember we would go to um, the Chicago Historical Society and see that, um, the, the, um, the displays that would explain what happened. And as I got older, I heard another story that made this even come to life for me as a Christian. Uh, Dwight L. Moody, uh, who is a great, great evangelist, ultimately started a school called Moody Bible Institute and uh, the benefits that we have from that. But let me read this to you. The Great Chicago Fire began about 9 p.m. Sunday, October 8th until early Tuesday, October 10th, 1871. This rapidly spreading fire killed approximately 300 individuals, destroyed roughly 3.3 square miles of Chicago, and left over 100,000 residents homeless. This devastating fire would greatly impact the life of American evangelist D.L. Moody. It is believed that the Great Chicago Fire spread so quickly because wood was the main building material used in Chicago. This included the building frames, walls, shingles, and even the sidewalks. To make matters worse, roofs that weren't topped with wood and shingles were made of flammable tar. Once the fire started, there were only 185 firefighters with 17 horse-drawn steam, steam engines available to protect the entire city. The firemen themselves were already worn out from fighting fires earlier in the week and were initially sent to the wrong location. Moody's church was destroyed as was his family's home and the homes of many of his congregation. Moody himself said that he was able to save nothing but his reputation and his Bible. But there was a more disturbing aspect to the great Chicago fire that involved Moody, however. D.L. Moody held his usual service the Sunday evening the fire broke out. At the close of the service, he asked his congregation to evaluate their relationship to Christ and to return the following week to make a decision. This, he thought, would give them time to really think over and result in a lasting decision. He wanted to make sure that they were sure about accepting Jesus Christ, not wanting to pressure them into making a decision they wouldn't stick with. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Ira Sankey was singing the closing hymn. It was drowned out by the sound of fire trucks and church bells. To his dying day, Moody regretted delaying their decision to the following Sunday. It would be a Sunday that many in the meeting hall would not live to see. Within a matter of hours, many of those who sat under Moody's words were dead. There's no way of knowing how many that night could have gotten their hearts made right with God had an altar call been given. There's no way of knowing how that sat under Mo those that sat under Moody's voice that night. Many died in that fire and were not ready to meet God. Moody would never be the same after that incident. He became very ill because of the guilt he carried. And as a dedicated soul winner, D.L. Moody took such missed opportunities very, very seriously. I have never since dared, Moody later said, to give an audience a week to think of their salvation. If they were lost, they might rise up in judgment against me. I've never seen that congregation since. I will never meet those people until I meet them in another world. But I want to tell you one lesson that I learned that night, which I have never forgotten. And that is, when I preach, to press Christ upon the people then and there and try to bring them to a decision on the spot. I would rather have that right hand cut off than to give an audience a week now to decide what to do with Jesus. And so that is why each week we don't necessarily have an invitation but you are invited. But to understand that today is the day of salvation, to not put off what God wants to do in your life. That has to do with salvation, but I believe that also has to do with his sanctifying work, that today may be the day where you go, you know, God, you're right about this too. I'm, I am a child of yours, but you're right about this too, and I'm not going to be playing games anymore. I want to get serious about you. And the older I get and the more that I talk to my brothers and sisters in Christ that are getting older with me, which, by the way, that's all of us, all right? Time is of the essence. Um, I know as a young person, it never occurred to me. I just thought I was immortal. I thought I was just like, life just keeps going on. But the reality is, 
God is constantly calling. And he's saying this, even, even Solomon in his wisdom, I know this is a book that's rough to read, but in his wisdom he says in Ecclesiastes, remember your creator in the days of your youth. So let's pray and allow the Lord to use this time in how he sees fit. Father, I thank you for your word and thank you for your faithfulness. And I'm asking you, God, to use this scripture, these scriptures. Each week we come to these sections in Romans and it's, it's, you're so direct, you're so blunt, you're so honest with us. There's no, there's no filter. You speak with grace but you give us truth. And so thank you for that. And I'm asking you, Lord, to use this third chapter as we start it today, this third chapter of Romans, in however you see fit. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number one, if you're taking notes, and I encourage you to write things down uh, in the back of your bulletin, we have some blanks you can fill in, but maybe you can write in some other things. Um, the contrast of human sinfulness, the contrast of human sinfulness. Let's look at what Scott had read to us earlier. Then what advantage has the Jew, or, or what is the value of circumcision? Now, I want you to think about that. He's writing this to a church in Rome. Uh, it looks like it's a, a, a mixed ethnic church. Remember that first chapter where he talks about salva uh, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew and also to the Greek. And then he goes into this diatribe of the sins that were a part of the Gentile world apart from any knowledge of God because what they did, if you remember this, and everybody has truth through general revelation, that rises up, but they suppress the truth. Remember, we were talking about that and playing that game, and the, you put it under the water, and oh, this is, uh, and then it just pops right up. The reality of, oh, that's true. There's a creator. I look, uh, look about, and, and we have just amazing design in this world, and it just any other thing, we would say there's a designer, but for whatever reason, people will suppress that truth, and they will act like, oh no, that, this is chance. This just happened. And because of that, what does God do? He abandons them. He turns them over to their sin. My daughter, that day when we were talking about it, it hit her so hard because she realized that for our Savior, when, remember when he, in the Bible it says, he became sin, and we even sang that he became sin who knew no sin? He took upon sin. Remember what happened with his father? His father turned his back on him while he's on the cross, and he says, Father, you know, he's like, you, even you have forsaken me? He's like, he's scared. He's, it's the realization of abandonment happens because of sin. And so we have that. And then we come to the second chapter, and he starts talking to the moral person, the person that is just a good guy, a good girl that is out in the world. Live a good life. They're good people. But they're without excuse too. And then he deals with the Jew. He says that you are the ones, you need to hear this too. Your ethnicity, your background isn't the thing that's going to save you. And so he has this here, and he says, <laughs> then what advantage has the Jew? Because in their minds, man, we, we were the guys, we were the group. What, what advantage? I mean, the Old Testament calls Israel the apple of God's eye. Look at this, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 10. He found him in a desert land and in a howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. Or Zechariah 2, verse 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. And if you've never heard that phrase, that's, a, that's basically, a, that it's the love of the person. 
And so God is that person. And so some of you, I watch you. I watch you when your kid is doing something. You'll watch during a Christmas program. Remember back in the day when you had those big old video cameras that would show up at the church or the school play? And instantly as the kid is starting to act, and all over the place, well, now it's the phones come out. And the look on your face, and they could be doing the dumbest stuff. And that's my kid. I won't go into stories of things that our kids did on stage, but there were moments that after we looked at the video, wow. But it's my kid. My kid can pick their nose better than any other kid up there. I want you to know that. So Paul raises two questions, which can really be understood as one. And given the critique of the Jew in Romans 2, 17 through 29, is Paul saying that there's no special blessing or this, this state that attaches to a Jewish heritage? Is the privilege associated with circumcision a thing of the past? I mean, we've got the, we have the, the um, ordinance of baptism, which we will see next week. And it's a, it's a dear thing. It's a, it's a special thing for us as Christians. Or perhaps Paul is raising this question, if, if having the law and circumcision raises the bar of acceptance by God so high, is it perhaps not an advantage to be born Jewish? So he's, he's basically throwing that out to the reader. He's making us stop and think about the fact that, Paul, you've got done just saying all of these things. And I just want to understand, because we, we put a lot of clout behind the fact that we're Jewish. So, and you've just knocked us, knocked us right out from under us. So, what do we do with that? Well, and I love how Paul, in his wisdom, and this is God thing, obviously, it's almost like he's talking back and forth. He, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, and what advantage has the Jew? What, what advantage is this thing called circumcision? This right that you hold to is so dear. Look at how he answers this, and this is the grace of God. Verse 2, much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Now, I want you to stop and think about that. And that word oracles, by the way, don't let that throw you. Oracles sound so potions and wizard-like. The oracles, you know. But don't let that word throw you. Sometimes you wonder why words are translated, because in another place, this is the Greek word lagos. And you've seen it before. We get the word word from it. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the word. That's lagos. It's the same root word here. So he uses, he uses oracles. And they're, <laughs> but I think it's the translator's goal is to get your attention. Because sometimes if we're not careful, we can, oh, this is the word, but the, it's, it's huge. Oracles for, in the pagan world, oracles were like this, this thing that would be lifted up and revered. And, and sometimes we can, even with the Bible, take it lightly. You've got the holy word of God. You, you have in your possession the word of God. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever heard of this guy named Francis Schaeffer back in the 70s? He, just, he was a guy that had long hair and a goatee, and he'd wear knickers. And you were, he was so cool that you were like, hey, that's even cool. You know? And he'd wear these things, and you'd say these things. And, and one time he was just talking about how dear the Scripture was to him, and he would just sit. There were times that he would just sit, and he doesn't have the Bible open. He just has it on a nightstand next to him. And this moves me when I think about it. He would just take his hand, and he'd just pat it, and he goes, I got the Word of God. I got the Word of God with me. And at any point, we're so blessed to be able to pick it up and read it. You can do that in freedom. And we've heard testimony after testimony. I could show you a video of people in China talking about what it's like for them, how they have to memorize it quickly because 
They don't know if it's going to be taken away from them. And so we could look at the Jews and go, yeah, you, got, you, had the, you had the oracles of God. You have the word. Christian, we have the word of God. And to hold to it is dear. And that's why he's saying to them, I, I've got a, I've, I'll tell you why you're so blessed. You got the word of God. Well, that's, that's not about me and my Jewishness. No, that, that's the thing. That's what's great. We're blessed as a church because we look at this book and we take it seriously. And if the day ever comes at Grace Bible Church that this isn't important, we're not doing church anymore. And there are places that call themselves churches that never even open it. And I want to say to you, that isn't church. Amen? Amen? That we, we look at this and we've got this. And so he's saying, no, you're, you are, what advantage has the Jew? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. God entrusted them with the lagos. And he's entrusting, dad, he's entrusting you with the lagos. Mom, young person, friend, you have the word of God. And to dwell in it, and the Bible says, richly, and allow the Lord to use it. Let's keep going. Verse 3. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? So he has two questions. He's saying, God is completely trustworthy, even when others are not. We can count on his promises and his judgments. Isn't that good to know? I know I need it. When things are messing up in my world, when things are going on and I don't get at all what's going on with God. Has anybody ever been there? I've been there. <laughs> what, are, what are you doing, God? What are you doing in this place and that place? And it could be very easy to get discouraged. And I want you to know, he can be counted on. He is faithful. Let's keep going. Verse 4. By no means. So he answers the question, what if some were unfaithful? Does that faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Some translations, God forbid. Look at this line. I love this. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. The answer is a huge no. Human speech may be toxic or treacherous and untrue, but God never lies. Isn't that, isn't that good to know? God doesn't lie. Titus 1, verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Do you try your hardest not to lie? There's so much lying going on. I remember when our kids would have things come up and we because we didn't want to lie we go we might do this because I didn't want to lie to them and by the way they even hated that answer all right they wanted to hear a sure thing but that's the deal in, in this verse by the way he's quoting Psalm 50 verse 6 the heavens declare his righteousness for God himself as the judge, Selah. So he's going back to that. He's saying God is always justified with his words. He will always prevail even if judged. Verse 5 of Romans 3. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? Now I want you to look at this parenthesis. I speak in a human way. Now, why has he put that in there? 
He wants you to know he's using worldly wisdom. He's using logic that any old guy would put, use, put out to us. He's not saying this is what God says. He's saying, I want to tell you, this is something that would be said. And so we say, but if our righteousness sh- serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? See, apart from, man, for, apart from God's wisdom, this is how you'd speak. It's like this, and I haven't been to this person very much in my life, okay? But if you've been to a jeweler, all right, and they want to bring out their wares to show you how beautiful those things are, what does he lay on the table first? Yeah, it's a black cloth, a black velvet, something there, and then he puts out that gold or that diamond, because as you look at it, you go, wow, compared to that, that looks so shiny, so bright. And so he's saying, if, well, if God's righteousness looks way better when I sin, why would he get mad at me? I mean, I'm actually making God look really good when I sin. Can you see how we could fall into that kind of trap left to ourselves? We just start rationalizing or saying, well, you know, sin and grace abounds. <laughs> I love abounding grace. But God won't let us play that game. He goes on in verse 6, he says, By no means, for then how could God judge the world? He's saying, no way, if, if God condones sin... He, have, he would have no equitable, righteous basis for judgment. And so, so a truth is said, and then we sin. We don't do what is supposed to be done. And that shows that God is righteous and we are not. We could rationalize and say, well, I'll just, I can, I'll just live like this and God gets glory, but doesn't want us to live like that. It'd be like this. If um, my dad says to me as a, a car is in my, now in my power, and he says, don't let the oil run out on the car. And I, in my lack of awareness, let the oil run out in the car, and the lights start sh- you know, shining brightly on the dashboard. And the smoke is coming out of the car. And I, instead of stopping, I go, you know what? By me driving further, I even show that my dad is even smarter of the fact that he said, don't let the oil run out in your car. So I floor it, and the smoke keeps coming, and ultimately I burn up the whole engine. But my dad is glorified. All right? You see the logic there? No, you don't see the logic there. That's stupid, all right? But that's how that kind of thinking is in whatever instance it is. So he's saying, look, let's keep going, verse 7. But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? Paul is saying if the truth of God is that my sin actually proves that God is righteous, then why am I not innocent? See how twisted we can get in our thinking? And he's he's putting that out because people have been saying these things. Why does the word of God say I'm guilty when in all reality my sinfulness has a good purpose in establishing God's glory? Let's keep going. Verse 8. And why not do evil that good may come? And then he talks about what's been going on with it. Why he's bringing these arguments up is because, look at this, as some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. He's rejecting the possibilities by asserting the aptness and justice of the condemnation of those who think this way. And so I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, if there's any temptation in your part to keep heading a direction in sin 
And you think, because I'm, ultimately the glory of God will be seen in me building a testimony. I've met people before that go, ah, they'll hear about these testimonies of God saving people from these sins, and they go, man, my testimony is boring, and I'm saying to you, no, 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 no. Any testimony is a testimony of God's grace. So don't head out of here going, I'm going to build a testimony, all right? Instead, here would be the testimony. He kept you from sin so that you don't add into your backpack of experiences another thing that you got to carry around. It's a really smart thing to not sin. Okay, I know that's real basic there, but I'm putting it on the bottom shelf. All of us. Let's keep going. The capacity, point number two, the capacity of human sinfulness. Look at verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, no, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. He's talking about the fact that we're not better off. We're not better off, by the way, too, as Christians, if we think this way. This under sin thing, is to be completely enslaved and dominated by sin. And now what starts to happen, and I love this, begins a series of Old Testament verses. I won't have them up here. I'll read these to you as we work through Romans here. But I'll tell you where the reference is so you can look them up on your own. Look at verse 10. As it is written, now I want you to stop for just a second as I say, as it is written. There's a push recently that I've been hearing of people to say, you know, the Bible to our culture and about really doesn't carry the power that it used to in generations past. So don't feel the strength to have to say or this, this, this need to say the Bible says, as if it's some sort of authority. Because they don't think it's an authority anyways. Can I say to you, in my my conversations with different individuals, what I found is, if I treat them with respect in whatever they believe, they will treat me with respect. And so you will hear, I've heard in conversations with people, things that I'm like, you believe that. You know, in my mind, I'm thinking, you believe that? But I don't say that, all right? Because that's what they believe. And I wouldn't want them to say that to me. But I have no problem saying to people, the Bible says. Because here's what I want. I don't want them to think, I say. Because my word, really, honestly, It doesn't last unless it's built into Scripture. And so I want to encourage you, treat people with respect as you have conversations because you want to be respected too. And then don't hesitate to say, the Bible says, because that's what as it is written. And and another thing, a side thing. I'm following a pattern of a person named Jesus because you remember when he was tempted by the devil? He says, it is written. He had no problem pointing back to the scripture. And so the word has power. I mean, we, let's face it, we do have the oracles of God. But look at this, as is written, and this is, a, this is a rough verse. None is righteous, no, not one. These verses, by the way, that we're going to look at in a few seconds here as we're going through are Psalm 14, 1 through 3, if you're taking notes, Psalm 14, 1 through 3, and Psalm 53, 1 through 3. These verses are teaching us that man is universally evil. (laughs) And a lot of people don't want to hear that in church. Make me feel good. I'm going to tell you the truth. That will make you feel good. All right. And I love how he says this. He goes, there is none righteous. And then there's one guy in the back. No, not one. (laughs) He shuts it down right away. I know I annoy some of you sometimes. Just I do this with my friends that will do stuff. And we'll say, hey, you want to do this? I'm good. I go, actually, you're not good. 
There's none righteous. No, not one. That's that Jesus juke, you know, you do. Verse 11. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Isn't that rough? There's none righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. By the way, how many is that? Everybody. Everybody. You're like, no, I, there's some people I talk to and they understand. That's because God is helping them understand. No, I know some people, they're seeking after God. No, they might be seeking religion. They might be seeking a way to better themselves. But scripturally, i got to go with the Bible on this one. No one seeks after God. And what I mean by that is no one seeks after the true God. All that is entailed in God. They might be seeking out. I've heard people say, well, I, my God's not that God. I'm thinking, well, then it's not God. Because they want to create a God in their mind that would never do this, and he would never do that, and he would always do this. Well, let's face it. If that's the case, then you're in charge. So you're God. None who understands. None who seeks after God. It's like, it's like in the corner. Poof. He's unable to comprehend the truth of God or to grasp his standard of righteousness. And his natural tendency is to seek his own interests. But verse 12, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Well, not even one. Wow. Remember what we were talking about, the first three chapters of the book? we got to find out our situation. We're condemned. This word, these words here where it says, turned aside, basically means to lean in the wrong direction. It was used of a soldier running the wrong direction, a deserting soldier. That's what man left to himself looks like. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we need the gospel. Reminds me of a verse in Isaiah 53. Turning aside. Look at that. Together they have become worthless. Wow. No one does good, not even one. Point number three, the criminality of human sinfulness, the criminality of human sinfulness. Look at verse 13, which is actually a quote of Psalm 5, 9. Verse 13 says this, Their throat is an open grave. Have you ever been around an open grave? Have you ever been around something that's dead? Remember as a kid walking to the, the store, we had a Puerto Rican store in our town. Every Chicago neighborhood had a Puerto Rican store, okay? It was the greatest thing in the world. They had all the, all the things you needed. And so we'd be heading that direction, and um, you'd go, we, there, we had the elevated, which was the L, which is the subway in some sections, but it would be above the ground. It was loud, the trains that would go past a house across the street. And underneath, it just seemed like there were always dead cats. But some of you are like, amen, I know. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know how they all died. I didn't kill any cats, all right? But there was all, and they stunk. If in your house you have mouse poison and they get stuck in a wall, oh, it stinks. He's talking here about human dead bodies. And he compares our mouth to that. Isn't that picturesque? Doesn't that grab your attention? What, what comes out of our mouth? This verse could be applicable to me in the morning, you know. Turn around, Kim, you're beautiful. Turn around. So the breath, you know, it's just, but the, the idea here is that it just stinks. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. 
the venom of asps is under their lips. Three sentences there that just hammer the words that we say. And if I were to say to you today, if you're banking on your righteousness to get you into heaven, all we'd have to do is talk about what you say. Have you, have you ever lied? Oh, well, I yeah. have a few fibs, you know. Have you ever blasphemed? Well, you know, the other day I hit my thumb with a hammer. I mean, what do you expect? Have you ever cursed out somebody? It doesn't take long for you to realize, man, what comes out of my mouth is my heart. In that marriage series that we're working through in Sunday school, so many times between just a husband and wife, this is someone you love and some of the things that we would say. Graves were sealed not only to show respect for the deceased, but to hide the sight and stench of the body's decay. As an unsealed grave allows those who pass to see and smell what is inside, the unregenerate person's open throat that is, the foul words that come from it reveal the decay of his heart. That marriage class, the reality is sometimes things, and you ever meet somebody, they'll say something, they go, oh, I didn't mean to say it. That's not me. And actually, it was you. That's what was on your mind. That's why you said it. Own that and say, I, I shouldn't have said that. And then he quotes here Psalm 140, verse 3. Toxic language springs from a malignant heart. You ever hear somebody and they use every word in the book and you just hear them and they just keep cussing and cussing and you go, wow, you're putting adverbs and adjectives and nouns in ways that, wow. But that's their heart. I remember when I was struggling with my language and they still come to my mind, but it's horrible. And what it was, it was a sign of my heart. Let's keep going. Verse 14. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. He's quoting Psalm 10, verse 7. It refers to wanting the worst for someone, publicly expressing that desire in caustic, divisive language. That bitterness, the open public expression of emotional hostility against one's enemies. Verse 15 moves from the mouth to other parts of the body. Their feet are swift to shed blood. These next three verses are from Isaiah 59, 7 through 8. Horrible truth even today. Widespread wars, bombings, the death of over 30,000 babies daily worldwide by abortion. We're killers. We aren't doing it physically. We're doing it mentally. We're doing it verbally. Look at verse 16. In their paths are ruin and misery. Man damages and destroys everything he touches, leaving a trail of pain and suffering in his wake. Doesn't take long to break down, does it? Doesn't take long. Think about you ever hear that phrase, sticks and stones will break bones, but words will never hurt me? You know it's a lie. I broke one bone, my wrist. And I forget about that. Every now and then there's a little bit of pain, but I forget about it. But I remember some things that were said to me years ago. Verse 17, the way the peace they have not known. The lack of any inner sense of peace, but man's tendency towards strife and conflict, whether between individuals or nations. Look at verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He's quoting Psalm 36, 1. Man's spiritual condition is nowhere more clearly seen than in the absence of a proper submission to and reverence for God. And I'll hear people talk about the fear of God, and they say, well, he's not, he's not talking about being afraid of God. He's just talking about a reverence. I want to say to you, we need to get to the point where we are afraid of God. 
we take God seriously. We fear if I do this, this is what's going to happen. We've moved so far away from that in our days of self-esteem and self-image. And the fear of God, you remember this in the Proverbs? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And no fear, I think what it's saying is if there's no fear, that's foolishness. Last point, point number four, the culpability of human sinfulness. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped. So he's basically saying, shut up. And the whole world may be held accountable to God. Every unredeemed human being are those. That's what he's saying. Both Jews and Gentiles are accountable. Jews have the written law. Gentiles have it written on their heart. They know when they're sinning. There's no defense against the guilty verdict. Yeah. But be silent. God pronounces that on the entire human race. Last verse here, verse 20. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. We shouldn't, I, there's times where you hear about the courthouse and there'll be a statue with, with uh, the Ten Commandments, and then there's a group of atheists that say, I want that taken down. And we take them, we've got to have statues of Moses with the, with the law, and that's great. The problem is, you know what the law is supposed to do? The law is supposed to make me go, I'm a sinner. We don't glory in the law. The law makes us go, man, I need a Savior. Doing what is perfect is what God requires. So this is what we've been getting from, Gen- uh, from Romans 1 through 3. There are two teams. There is the sinner under sin. They have a passport and it's stamped, you live in a place called under sin. And then there's another passport under grace. That's it. But this person, no. Silenced. And we don't like that. We want so badly to have, a, we want to have a suburb. The city, and then you got the, but no, we want a suburb. No, it doesn't work that way. The law makes sin known, but it can't save. Heard recently of a testimony that I'd like to show you here, a testimony of D. James Kennedy, if you've ever heard of him. He's the one who created the, series, the, the evangelism explosion, if you remember that. I want, to hear, want you to hear his testimony, how he came to Christ. Take a listen. I grew up being sent to Sunday school and church, and when I got to be about 13 or 14, and old enough to make a loud enough squawk, well, my parents stopped sending me. I went through a period of about nine or 10 years where I rarely went to church at all, maybe on Easter on a good year, but that was about all. I had no real interest in spiritual matters. I had never learned anything in church that really uh, appealed to me or grasped my attention. I had never understood or heard the gospel. And one thing I loved to do was to dance. And so when I was in college, I applied for a job uh, teaching dancing at Arthur Murray. And he became a dance instructor and was quite good at it and became even a manager of one of the Arthur Murray dance studios in the Tampa area. One day, Ann Lewis came in, that was just one of the customers, and Jim Kennedy went into the back and told somebody, I just met the woman that I'm going to be married to. Jim Kennedy had no place for God in his life, but one day in his early 20s, he went to bed after a wild party on a Saturday night, and I was sleeping in one Sunday morning when I 
heard a radio broadcast and what had been music the night before was a preacher that morning. Suppose that you and I should go out of this building and a swerving automobile should come up on the sidewalk and kill the two of us. You are going to meet God. And if in this next minute God should say to you, what right? And note my emphasis on the word, what right do you have to come into my heaven? What would be your answer? Perhaps and so I listened, and for the first time in my life I heard the gospel. I heard the incredible good news of the free offer of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that how his death was the payment for my sins, and that he had purchased for me a place in heaven that if I would receive him into my life and trust him as my Savior and Lord, that I could be forgiven and have eternal life. Well, my initial response was that was too good to be true. So we went to a newsstand, and he said, do you have any religious books? And he told me one time, I shudder to think now, what I might have received. What I actually received was the greatest story ever told by Fulton Ausler. I stayed home each night and read a part of that, and the following Saturday night, I completed the book and slipped onto my knees there in my room and invited Jesus Christ into my life as Savior and Lord. And my life has never been the same since that day. And he then went on to transform the lives, literally, of millions of people through his radio, television, his writings, and his one-on-one -on -one evangelism training that's gone out into all the world. So now I want to invite you